books are longer, I, I'm going to have to use Sunday nights to uh, go back to that at times. I'd, I like to use the New Testament readings for uh, the Sunday morning services. Occasionally doing the Old Testament readings is good, like we did uh, this morning on the book of Ruth, since it was a perfect Mother's Day sermon as far as the theme. I'm not saying I had a perfect sermon, but as far as the theme, uh, it was a, a perfect sermon for Mother's Day. And, and occasionally we'll be going to the Old Testament for some significant uh, sections of Scripture. Uh, Wednesday night we left off um, with chapter 11. We went through chapter 11. It had a lot of, of book of numbers. That's what we're on. If you want to turn to that now in your Bible, the book of numbers. Uh, last Wednesday we were on chapter 11 and we saw a lot about the complaining of the children of Israel as they traveled through the wilderness, how Moses became extremely discouraged and even so depressed that he asked God to kill him. Uh, God responded by giving him 70 elders and filling them with the Holy Spirit so that they would be able uh, to have the wisdom to help him uh, guiding these people. And then we see in the latter part of chapter 11 uh, about God sending quail into the camp because the people were getting tired of eating the manna from heaven and the, uh, he sent quail in the camp as well. And even then, uh, they were not thankful for it. We'll start with chapter 12 tonight. Now, we won't be looking at every chapter in the book of Numbers because Numbers has numbers. For example, when we um, look at some of the things that are in Numbers, it's just a list of numbers about the tribes and uh, how many people were in the tribe and how many people of uh, age 20 years and older that are, can serve in the war and uh, how many leaders in each tribe. So uh, we find that in chapter 13, for example. Uh, there's a list there uh, from uh, verses 3 all the way down to 15, which I'll not read to you. If you're interested, you can read them, but it names every tribe, uh, all the 12 tribes, and the leader of each tribe, because that's when they were exploring uh, Canaan. But we're going to look first at chapter 12, and we'll look at the whole chapter. It's brief. It's only, we're going to use 14 verses, uh, oh, that maybe a little bit more. We'll use uh, uh, down to, well, most all but one verse, I guess. Starting with uh, verse uh, 1, we see that not only do the people that are mad about the things that Moses does, uh, complaining constantly, not only do they cause Moses problems, but his own brother and sister cause him problems. Um, Aaron and Miriam. And God has to punish Miriam here in this chapter because they're challenging the leadership of Moses. Now, each of them have a leadership position. We see some of the words of Miriam in the Bible, uh, called her the Song of Miriam, where she praises God for their deliverance from the Egyptians. So she has sort of a prophecy uh, gift at times. And then we know Aaron is the high priest, and God uh, uses him to rule over all the other priests who take care of all the religion uh, of the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, taking care of the tabernacle and the sacrificing of all of the animals. So he has a, a very important job. But for some reason, they challenge him and challenge God at the same time because they think they have a, should have more of a influence uh, in leadership and in a greater position. And of course, uh, Moses is very humble. It says in verse 3, now Moses 
of chapter 12, was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now, we told you that Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So now you may look at this verse and say, why would Moses write this about himself? Well, first of all, I don't think Moses wrote this about himself. I believe even though he wrote most of the five books, that there were others that had to put some history in. For example, when he died, there was um, information there about where he would bury, be, I mean, who, that God would bury him. And uh, later on uh, in the New Testament, it's, it's, it's told that uh, the devil and uh, Michael the archangel were fighting over the body of Moses. So God buried him probably, even though the scripture doesn't say specifically, probably so that the Jews would not worship uh, his body because they were prone to worship many things just as their uh, religious neighbors who didn't obey God uh, did. So what I think is that these, and notice it's in parentheses there, even in this translation, I think others have put that in. Uh, and I think it's inspired, but I think others had uh, written it in there. Now Moses had to be a very humble uh, person uh, to put up what he put up with. If he was a person who became very angry easily, we know he did become angry and it kept him out of the promised land. But if he became very angry easily, he probably would have quit or committed suicide or something like that. Because uh, uh, God, even at times, will notice, uh, wanted to give him a new nation. But he taught God out of it, so to speak, because he did love the people and he did want them to survive. So let's read about it now in chapter 12 of Numbers. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Now when his wife died, he remarried, and he remarried a woman who had black skin. She was Cushite. And they were... Uh, and probably non-Jewish. And so uh, he was criticized for that. Uh, said for he had married a Cushite. And then, but notice the real reason. You know, sometimes people say they're angry at you for a reason, but underneath there's another reason. And I think the Bible points out the other reason in their own words. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses. There are others who came along and challenged Moses. And God destroyed them because they were leading uh, delegations of people away from him. Now here his own brother and sister saying, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And of course God did speak through them. He spoke through Miriam. Her words are found in the Bible. He spoke through Aaron, uh, the first high priest. Uh, and the Lord heard this. But the Lord was very unhappy, we're going to notice in verse 4. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now he's going to prove to them that God chose Moses. Come out to the tent of meeting. That's another name for the tabernacle, which was the uh, tent of meeting, sometimes called the tabernacle, which was the uh, place of worship that they could move. Whenever the people moved through the wilderness, the first thing they did was pack up the tent of meeting, uh, which was a place of worship. It was sent in, set up in the very middle of the camp. And then the 12 tribes had designated areas uh, on the north, south, east, and west side. Three tribes to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. And so their religion was central. And uh, so he said, come on out to the tent a meeting. And he was going to prove to them and the people that he chose Moses. He said, all three of you come. So the three of them went out. 
Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. Now you remember that God used this pillar of cloud often with the children of Israel. Uh, it would stand there at the tabernacle when they weren't moving around. When they were moving around in the daylight, this pillar of cloud would go in front of them to protect them. And then there was also a pillar of fire uh, at night that would protect them as well. One of the things that some Bible scholars think the purpose of the pillar was, uh, of the cloud, if that's what you want to use, because it, it was a cloud, and I never thought about this, but it makes sense. Here they are in the desert, and some scholars believe that the cloud was large enough that it overshadowed them and kept the sun from beating down upon them as much. And knowing God and how well he took care of them by providing their water and food in the desert and, and not letting them get any diseases and letting them get water from a rock and their clothes never wearing out and their shoes never wearing out. That makes sense that he would have this cloud overcast them so that they would be protected from uh, the sun rays. But he appeared in this pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. Now this is what God is telling Miriam and Aaron. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. Now throughout the Bible, we see that when we get into the prophets, uh, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel, and Ezekiel, and all the prophets, you're going to notice that God spoke to them in dreams and visions. But he said, this is not true of my servant Moses, for he is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face. What an honor. Clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Now, he can't see God because no person is allowed to see God and live, the Bible says. But he is allowed to see the, the form uh, of the Lord. Why then, this is what he's talking now to them personally, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against... Now notice what he said. Not her. Don't hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. You may wonder, well, why didn't God give Aaron this disease as well? Aaron was the high priest. It was up to him to diagnose disease and then present it to the Lord so that they could be healed. That's what's done in this case. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. Now, you notice here Moses' reaction. Uh, even though people sin, even though the congregation sin, he was always asking God to help them and forgive them and to heal them and protect them. And so uh, we see as we move on something kind of strange. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp. Now this was the normal uh, thing that was done uh, medically speaking. If you had a leprosy, you had to remain away from people, which is lo logical because you could catch the disease for seven days. And he said after that she can be brought back. In other words, the high priest would examine her, and if it was gone, she could live among the people. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on till she was brought 
back. Out of respect for her, uh, they didn't move the camp uh, until she was completely healed. And then that last verse in chapter 12, after that, the people left Hazaroth in a camp in the desert of Paran. There's an interesting true life story that was presented to me by a member of our congregation uh, who went to another church when he moved out of our area. And uh, the church was a very large congregation. Uh, it was one of what we call a mega church. You know, it had over a 1,000, uh, going on 2,000 people. And I think it's quite interesting. Now, the man I'm going to refer to, uh, which I'll give no names. I'm not going to name the person in our church or the minister or the church. Uh, but uh, this story was related by, um, uh, you know, this man firsthand. He knew this information. And uh, this minister, he said, was a great minister. He had great ability with people. Um, he went to this smaller congregation. It was a Christian church. And uh, uh, he helped build it up. There was another congregation not far from them that was dwindling in their attendance. So they got together and said, why don't we make one congregation? So they would join together, melded together, and formed another congregation. And it was very successful. Uh, until it came to the time that they had to buy more property because the congregation was getting towards a thousand strong and they needed uh, much more room. So they purchased a Walmart facility that they left and started a new one in the area and they remodeled the Walmart facility and of course they had all this parking. Well, sad to say, uh, and I think this person from our congregation was actually one of the leaders at this church, uh, that the, but he wasn't an elder, uh, that the elder said that they wanted him to leave. Now, can you imagine a man bringing two congregations together, uh, making it, building it up to about 500, and then to 1,000, uh, then almost 2,000 with brand, these new facilities, and saying to him, uh, we uh, believe that we need some new ideas. I wonder, some, what in the world are people wanting? You know, people are the, I, I say this, people are the same. Can you imagine? And, and this man from our church, I said, well, did the minister go to another church? He said, no, he just, he took another job somewhere. Look what he was able to do for the Lord. You know, that discouraged him so much. I mean, what, I mean, what more could you do? You know, I mean, if you build a church from 100 to 2,000, wouldn't you think, well, I must be doing a pretty good job somewhere. But uh, they wanted to move on. I don't know if they, whatever happened. Uh, I think it's still a good-sized congregation, but I just wonder if the Lord blessed them as much as he did with that person. So I think of this in terms of leadership. Today, as well as in the time of Moses, there's always people that are opposing the leadership of a church. Uh, now, Sharondale's kind of unique. You don't do that so much. Now, that's why I'm still here, and uh, next year will be 50 years. So uh, you can't blame yourselves because you're not like that. But many churches are uh, because they believe that after so long, you, the preacher just needs to move on and maybe move on a lot sooner if he's not doing what we want him uh, to do. One of my preacher friends uh, told me this, and uh, it was several years back. And he said that the congregation where he was at, he was sitting in an officer's meeting, and uh, uh, they got together and decided what kind of things the officers divide up their responsibilities. Great job, great idea. And some of them said, well, we'll take care of the youth and I'll take care of the bus ministry, and, uh, and uh, I'll oversee such and such. Uh, maybe the grounds was another one. When the elder spoke up, and, this, and he was serious as a heart attack, he said, and uh, I'll take the responsibility of keeping check on the preacher. So you see, that is just disregard and disrespect. And by the way, that church uh, tripled in size while he was there, too. 
And uh, it just shows you the attitudes of people many times are just not in the right place. And, and Moses had to suffer that and endure that again and again and again. It, I, I bet you think I'm preaching the same sermon uh, three or four times when I go through this Old Testament, but it's really the same theme over and over about the people uh, getting upset with Moses and complaining against Moses and, and all the things that they had to go through and he wasn't doing enough for them and all of that. So we, there's a great lesson to be learned that we better not be uh, complaining. Now there are times that preachers need to leave. There are some preachers that are not spiritual. There are some preachers that even though they may be successful in building up a congregation may have moral issues and that has to be challenged. I understand that. And uh, I can understand if, if you're hiring a minister and you're getting to absolutely nowhere, uh, that maybe you do need to change. I understand that. But I often wondered when a church was growing and, and the minister was doing a great job of what, what's wrong with this picture. Another interesting thing happened in our county many years ago. Um, there was a, a church, and the minister wound up, he was a young preacher at the time that tried out at this church in Pike County, and uh, he um, uh, did a great job in, in his trial sermon and went on uh, to be a very well-known, famous preacher in the Brotherhood. Uh, now, this church could have had him. I don't know why they didn't have him, but he preached his trial sermon, and... Um, on his trial sermon, he had like three baptisms, and they didn't hire him. <laughs> I mean, I, I just wonder sometimes what people are looking for, you know. Uh, and uh, so uh, he did go on and become uh, a, a great minister in, in the Lord's church. And, and so he didn't give up. He didn't get discouraged. But people uh, can get discouraged. Uh, leaders can get discouraged, not just preachers. Elders can. Deacons can because the work is very, very difficult. And that's why the Bible tells us to love uh, the leadership. Even in the New Testament, it's emphasized as well. So we'll, on Wednesday, continue to uh, look at a couple more uh, chapters here, at least in Numbers, before we leave that book. And, uh, but tonight, that's the end of that section of Scripture that we'll use. And... Uh, I just want you to be aware of how serious it is to speak against God's chosen leaders, and especially the ones that are spiritual, the ones that are working their hearts out to do a good job, and they need to be uh, supported. And I don't just mean the ministers, I mean the elders and the deacons, uh, the teachers uh, who present great lessons, and we, anybody that's in a leadership capacity uh, needs to be respected and appreciated uh, for what they do. So tonight we're going to have our closing hymn, and um, it's 636. Is that correct, Bruce? All right, only a step. So we'll be having this, and uh, let's be standing now and be singing the first stanza. If you're here tonight and have a desire to step out and confess the Lord as your Savior and be immersed if you truly have faith and repentance in your heart, only God knows that, uh, yeah, but we assume that you do when you step forward, and so your, your soul's prepared then uh, with these two steps, uh, and then you're ready to go on and move on to confession and baptism. If that's what you want for your life, please step down the aisle. I'll meet you, greet you, and find out your need. So let's sing the first stanza of Only a Step.